just say one word, a couple of words, and then turn it over to Joseph to talk a little bit. Um, and then I have some questions to get started in a conversation with Joseph. Um, and I don't know how we've organized it to take con questions. Do we, do we have a microphone from the audience too at some point? Is that, I should have asked. We've been uh, asking questions without the mic and we feel Okay, good. Sure. Um, great. So um, I'm Peter Rosenblum, and I, um, it's a pleasure to see you all, and I hope to meet many of you in the course of your time at Bard. I, I teach human rights, and I um, came to Bard after a fairly long career in human rights in different parts of the world, um, and I had the pleasure of having Joseph in my class. So when I heard he was coming here, I really leaped at the opportunity. Now, I don't leap at the opportunity to host every one of my former students. I, I love my former students, but it turns out that I do love some more than others. Um, and I love them for the questions that they asked and the struggles they shared and what they brought to our classroom and to our community. Um, and so many of you will be doing that. Um, and Joseph did that in my class in a very special way. It was an introductory human rights class. Um, and in some ways, you might think that um, to someone who himself um, was a refugee in some of the most horrific circumstances of, of, of escape and, and struggle that exist in our world today, that to be in a room with barred students talking about human rights would feel so, so distant and, and so naive, perhaps, and so lost. Um, but Joseph really was able to dive in and to challenge us and challenge himself and challenge me in a way where the questions he asked and the things he reflected on have stayed with me until now. And I hope that um, here we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that, because um, sometimes you might think about human rights as a kind of simple do-gooder tale, and it turns out uh, no, There's, there, there are choices, hard choices, and, and, and a reality to achieving um, some improvements at risk of, of harms in other places. Not everybody can take that on, and, um, but it's something that really Joseph has lived and, and really brought to us. I'll just say one other thing about why, um, for me, it's so special. I, I have had a long career in human rights. I started my work in, uh, in, in what was called Zaire, now the Congo, um, in the late Cold War years. I've, I've spent time really in countries around the world doing field work. I've seen a lot of struggle. For me, North Korea was impossible to understand. For me, there are certain countries that were beyond reach, that were not connected in any way that I understood to the kind of struggles and the kind of movements that I was able to be a part of. And so I just ignored them. I can give you the list. There were a list of countries that for much of my life I just said, no, I don't know what to do. I, nope, that's off the list. There's no hope for what I do, for the way I think about the world. And North Korea was on that list. So I kind of say that as provocation because it's certainly not on Joseph's. I mean, it is Joseph's list, and he has a lot to say about making those kinds of connections and being able to bring it back into a story of human rights. So now I've already spoken more than I said I would, but uh, let me set things off then for you. Well, first of all... Hello. Uh, thank you so much for that kind uh, words about me. Uh, it's great to see you again, definitely, and uh, great to be back on campus. Uh, I actually, my first year, I stayed in, uh, I lived in Tewksbury, so which I can see it from here. Um, Yay, there you go. <laughs> Just one? <laughs> yes. Um, my name is Joseph. Uh, I'm, uh, I was born and raised in North Korea. When I was 12 years old, my father died of uh, hunger. Uh, and I was, I, about two to three million people died from starvation during that time. But I never thought that my father would become one of them, so I definitely was not ready for a world without father. And um, so, and then my sister, older sister, was sold to a man in China, and I still don't know where she is. 
and uh, my mother, to make a long story short, was uh, sent to prison for attempting to leave North Korea without the government's uh, permission, which, and um, so I lived on the street as homeless for about three and a half years. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges about being homeless was learning how to break my pride. Otherwise, I could not uh, go to strangers on the street and asking for uh, the leftover food. Um, there are a lot of other lessons that I learned and I appreciate today, uh, but it's an experience that I, I do not want to repeat. Uh, and uh, I came to the United States in 2007. I did not speak a word of English, but uh, the expectation was that I was uh, to go to school in, uh, uh, start first year in high school, so ninth grade, finished high school, went to New York City for two and a half years for community college. I studied business management, uh, and then when I transferred to Bard, I changed my major to political studies. And um, I will finish my remark with, um, and I've been working on uh, uh, North Korean human rights issues, promoting uh, the need of uh, uh, raising awareness about human rights issues uh, in North Korea. And one of the reasons why I do it is because uh, um, I care about North Korean people. And um, it is perhaps one of the darkest places uh, in the world on both literal and uh, figurative uh, speaking. Uh, but at the same time, one of the reason why I, reasons why I wanted to work hard on this issue is because it's still a home for me and it's a home to 25 million people. Uh, there is a, in South Africa, I think uh, in Johannesburg uh, International Airport, there is a, a message on the world saying, they call it Africa, we call, they call it Africa, but we call it home. In many ways, uh, North Korea, um, yes, it is a dark place, but it's a place that I uh, close to my heart, and I hope that it's a place where uh, the darkness can be um, uh, overcome. And uh, lastly, uh, I remember watching a movie a couple of years ago uh, titled on the, on the Basis of Same uh, Sex. I think it was about um, Ruth. Oh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg Ruth, yes. on the basis of yes. sex. On the, yeah. there, is, uh, there was a, a professor from Harvard uh, where he, the law professor, during, an, during a lecture he said, a judge will, give me one second. A judge will not be influenced by the weather of the day, but a judge will inevitably influenced by the climate of era. I think there are many different ways to interpret that uh, beautiful sentence, but my takeaway was that, uh, as uh, Professor Rosenblum uh, had mentioned, uh, in times, changing North Korea seems so impossible, and I certainly can't do it by myself, but I believe um, collectively, uh, as we uh, have an opportunity to change, uh, and change for, for the good of the people uh, suffering in North Korea. So again, great to be back, and thank you for the opportunity to share about uh, my work and my story. So let me um, start by, by taking the temperature of the room, finding about the weather of the day. Um, how many of you feel like you, you have a general understanding of what makes North Korea particular in the story of politics and human rights? 
That's a good showing. That's pretty good. Um, does anyone want to shout out a couple of things that, 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 that are on your mind when you raise your hands like that? Just shout it out. What is it that, what things make it particular in terms of politics and human rights? Speak loudly. Um, killing his uncle. So this kind of, at the, the leadership is, is a very tightly controlled family leadership with, with, with tales of intrigue and of executions, disappearing of, of people. Okay, that's, I'll just, let's hear a few things just to have a sense. Yeah, excellent. Okay, any more? Control over emotions expressed in public. Control over, can you expand on that? Like control over everything in public, control over the public space. Media. No, is there media? Is there media other than the state? Probably not. Um, anything else people would throw out? What about the borders? Complex, so part of the story we're gonna have to hear about at least China and, and South Korea and maybe Russia and Japan, we'll hear, that might come into the conversation. Anything else? Um, border, issue with South Korea. border issue with South Korea, right? Not even technically a border or maybe, yeah? In what's, they don't play well with others, but how does that, anything else that was specifically on your mind with that? I think they can't be influenced by countries like the US. The influence seems almost like it doesn't work, at least the ways that we think of, or there's something that really, that sense that it doesn't work, which will be key to what Joseph will talk to us about, how you influence a country that seems not to be influenceable in the other ways. So I would say, and, and, and people haven't mentioned the levels of repression or the uses of food, the reasons for starvation, the, in, the borders that are shut, the other, some of the other elements of repression that have been so, have made it so extreme. Anyone else, anything else that people would shout out about that? I'm sure you have questions and we can get to those. Okay, now another temperature question. Um, do you guys believe in human rights? Raise your hands if you believe in human rights. Okay, what, is that, what does that mean? What, do you, what does that mean? What, is, what does it mean that you believe in human rights? Why don't you raise your hand? So someone who believes in human rights, just let me know what it means. You believe it exists, they exist. You believe you have faith that those are things. You, you believe that all humans are entitled. You believe that uh, your country should be working for them in other places. Is, is that what you meant? Or something else? Yeah, young woman there with a hand that looks like it's almost about to go up. Yeah, why not? You're not sure if it's universal and inherent, and as a result, maybe there aren't human rights in North Korea, and maybe we shouldn't care. Does that mean that? No, it doesn't mean that. Oh, sure, sorry. I just wanted to get as much, like, for you also to know what you're hearing and talking to. I see. Okay, so 
alas, I know I really, this can be so interesting. Okay, good, good, because I think it'll be, it'll make the conversation, we'll, we'll figure out where to put it. So does the United States or your country, wherever you are from, have some obligation, moral or legal, to work for human rights everywhere, everywhere? in particular countries in North Korea? And how would you even make that determination? So I can't see someone's brushing his hair or raising his hand. It's sometimes hard to tell. Yeah. Okay, great, okay. People are dying, they're starving in North Korea. It's a government that's doing it to them. It's pretty clear. Let's imagine, let's think for a second. Um, young man in the back. Okay, can I hear from two more people who haven't spoken, and then Joseph, if you have other questions to ask them, um, we can follow up with that and otherwise go to you. So the young woman here and the young man in the back. Okay, keep that in mind, that listening to the people and when it's possible. And okay, young man in the back. Where were you coming out of? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Jewish, so my father has two I see. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So there you there there we have <laughs> there we have something to start with. And I just think about our class again and I think about the uh, the kind of questions you've had about how you make human rights work and when it works and where it works and then what that means for you and for your country. Um, would you like to kind of reflect on that question or ask other questions? I think I need at least a few more years to process that <laughs> complex <laughs> thoughts, but I think uh, one response is that uh, when it comes to uh, talk about uh, moral responsibilities versus legal responsibilities, um, I don't remember exactly exact quote, but I believe uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Dr. King said, we are not freed, <laughs> what's the, we can't be freed unless 
all people. All people are freed. I don't think I'm quoting that um, exactly, but yeah, that's where I stand. Uh, I think the true freedom uh, comes when not only I'm free, but also um, people that we care about. So that's, yeah, that's where I stand, I think. So what, what um, maybe we can, like the workings of human rights, that um, when you said that uh, North Korea doesn't kind of play, well, I, I recharacterize it as play well with others. It doesn't operate in the international diplomatic system in a way that we're familiar with. It doesn't, when someone said we need to hear the voices of North Koreans, there are no voices of the press. There are, there is no civil society. There are maybe just a few refugees. When, when the human rights movement as it built, and you've brought up examples of South Africa, that a lot of the power of organizing in human rights really came from countries like the United States and came from students, and we studied that together. Um, but one of the big differences, or two differences in the case of South Africa was one, you had the African National Congress, which was leading the campaign, which was telling the world what it needed and making sure that others went along so that the boycott was driven by South Africa, so that the campus crusades were run with that inspiration of the ANC. And secondly, that South Africa was a Western ally tied into the, the, the Western capitalist banking, mining industry in such a way that they were influenceable. So, so what about North Korea? Is North Korea influenceable through the normal tools of human rights that we've, that we've developed through time? And, and feel free to just you know, think broadly and share your thoughts about how, you've, how your thoughts have evolved on this, because I know that you've given this a lot of thought over time. Yes, so I would like to respond to that question in two ways. Uh, number one, um, someone from the audience earlier mentioned that uh, we have uh, issues at our home. Uh, why don't we focus on uh, domestic issues first before we go abroad? Um, yes, I, but I think we can do both. I, I think we can take care of our domestic issues, but also in abroad. Um, and also, I think the cyber society is a key element. I think. Uh, even United States uh, uh, U.S. government can be wrong uh, on so many uh, occasions, but the difference between uh, liberal democracy versus uh, an, uh, in authoritarianism or authoritarian government is that uh, in the United States we have a civil society uh, and groups that uh, have the opportunity to hold uh, accountable of our government. So I think that's the uh, probably the benefit, the most, uh, mm, that is the wisdom of uh, democracy in my understanding. In terms of, uh, in North Korea, yes, in South Africa, uh, we, there, in the sense that students in the United States could create a movement that, uh, uh, that supports, um, um, uh, not supports, I mean the boycotting and which uh, in my opinion, uh, I, if I remember correctly, those movements led into uh, companies and corporations to uh, uh, leave the country uh, which brought attention for the oppressors at the time. So in that sense, yes, in North Korea we can't uh, have and start a movement in the sense we can't create a protest or in, on the streets in North Korea. But I do think that uh, we have an opportunity to create a movement in their minds, of, uh, in the minds of North Korean people. What do I mean by is that North Korean regime, one of, the, one of their control uh, tools was uh, uh, information blockade, which was basically uh, completely cutting off the information going inside and outside of North Korean regime. So North Korean citizens were, uh, had no choice but to believe what they were told. And uh, that, that 
uh, system worked, uh, but I think that is starting to change, which I talked about in my senior thesis. I think more and more North Koreans are curious about our side of the uh, 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 regime. And uh, I don't think that, in my opinion, fear cannot dominate curiosity. What I mean by it is that when uh, ordinary North Korean people started asking questions about how come South Korea is so much richer than us when we have the same history, same uh, culture, and I think those questions will eventually uh, subvert the regime because uh, that questioning the regime uh, is something that was not uh, not only permissible, but not uh, also, it was not desired among the citizens, but I think more and more North Korean people are thinking about where they are today and also questioning whether what they, are, uh, what they have been told is true or not. So yes, we can't go in North Korea and create a movement, but I think one of the roles that we uh, with, uh, can play, uh, we, when I mean by we, that includes uh, international uh, community, but also non-profit organizations. We could send the uh, information inside North Korea, which will help them to uh, a question, come up with more and more questions. So that's, I think, one way to start. But how, 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 maybe just as a, to understand again with, with a country that is so rigid and so closed, how does that even happen? Is it, is it through the, because of their, their need to open up a little bit economically that's, that's allowed in information that's come along the way? How is there any information that actually is flowing to the country? And how do you know whether it's affecting people's consciousness? Mm. So, um, there are still, I mean, one is there is um, illegal trade activities on the border side within North Korea where North Koreans would take their natural goods uh, and take it uh, and trade with uh, uh, some other industrial goods from China. So that's one way to uh, information, when I say information, it could be as simple as uh, uh, movies from South Korea, movies from uh, Hollywood. Those will event, uh, inevitably will change North Korean people's mind because a lot of times in North Korea, the movies are about uh, how a citizen must uh, devote and die for the regime and the leader, well as in movies uh, from Hollywood, um, they're all movies that are dying for their lovers, which is uh, quite revolutionary in North Koreans' perspective. So I think those different contents will uh, uh, change their mind. And so illegal uh, trade activities done between uh, North Korean ordinary citizens, uh, between uh, Chinese citizens, uh, that's one way. And also North Korean regime has their own uh, trade uh, companies that is uh, quasi-independent from the state, but still um, be able to trade goods between China. And also there are about 30,000 North Koreans living in South Korea. They also have been key uh, um, agent where they were sending money back to North Korea to their family members so that, that they can survive and they, along the way, it's also an opportunity where they can send the information to the country. And there are also different, a few different organizations that are specifically working on uh, sending uh, uh, movies and uh, documentaries or, or even Vipers through U uh, USB. And um, one of the reasons why I titled my thesis was um, uh, usually the word, I mean, the corruption is not a great for uh, system because corruption can uh, bring down the system uh, of governance. But in my opinion, I think 
the kind of uh, corruption that I have uh, been able to analyze and study during my research was, I think corruption is actually works for the North Korean people and in a good way. So what I mean by it is that because um, so the police, uh, state police, they were the one who supposed to survey and watch people, but they're also, during the famine, they were also not getting enough food from the regime. So let's say um, I was watching a foreign movie uh, at a home and I got caught. I could basically say, hey, like, um, can I, can you just like give me a pass this time? I will give you X, Y, Z amount of money. And the police uh, also needs to uh, feed the family and support the family. So when the police uh, accept that bribe, he become part of the, uh, involved with that cr crime. So they become mutual hostage. So in that sense, the re North Korean regime, it's harder for them to rely on uh, local police uh, force to effectively monitor the entire country. So I, in that sense, I think corruption is, uh, is uh, working well for the North Korean people. Um, so that's what I meant. So by. because the border is, um, is somewhat porous and they've allowed illegal trade and there's some North Koreans who are able to get goods in and then have enough to also bribe police and keep those networks going. That's, that's where that corruption has actually contributed to the possibilities of people learning more and knowing about what's happening. Right. Um, one of the things that you and I spoke about briefly um, when I was being, I don't, I don't wanna, this is one of the most depressing subjects on earth. So we need to make sure we recognize the horrors of it and also come out looking at the bright spots that are real, and I, and I know they are real. But just for the depressing bits, again, um, you know, as someone, again, who's been working in human rights for my whole career, I'm, I'm generally depressed every morning when I get up. Um, I get excited by all the stories of, of activism and movements. I don't know if anyone wants to be excited about something. You need little hopeful moments in the world. There were just very exciting, successful elections in Zambia last week. Check out your papers, reason to be cheerful. But lots of reasons to be really sad and to think that the international pressures for human rights are getting harder and harder. And one of the reasons is the, is the increased surveillance and technology that's also to be used. So all of the stories I've read about China and that border, they rely on the chaos of being able to cross. They rely on being able to operate between the cracks. And, and we were discussing this and this, this, this question, China could just end that tomorrow if they wanted, right? Yes, but China has been so reluctantly, they say one thing in international on uh, stage, they say they support uh, human rights, but in reality, they're sending North Koreans, uh, they catch North Koreans and send back to uh, North Korea, which despite of knowing the, the grave consequences these uh, individuals will face. And so yes, I mean, the question is how can we uh, make China to comply with the international norm, uh, norms and uh, they have been stubborn in one They've sense. been stubborn and, and the, the border control has become worse or it's the same? I mean, you mentioned that there's now more technology at the border, mm -hmm. which means that it's even harder to use fraudulent IDs, to use the other tools that people had to cross before. So the borders had, the security had become even uh, uh, more tightened. So since Kim Jong-un became in power, I believe in 2011, 12, um, the number of North Korean refugees uh, uh, Escape, be, uh, being able to escape from North Korea to China and South Korea had dropped significantly. Uh, for example, like last year, we did not 
have a single North Korean refugee came to the United States. So it's, it's becoming harder and harder for North Korean to escape. Uh, not to say that it was easier, be, uh, it was easy before, but it just became much harder. And technology comes to a play in China because it um, used to be at least if uh, one North Korean refugee could uh, uh, have enough money or seek to buy fake ID, they could get around the city. And when the Chinese uh, police ask uh, ID, they could present that uh, a hard copy of uh, ID. Now they have a digital, uh, uh, I guess, electronic IDs, which is harder to um, play around with the system. So for North Koreans, it's, uh, it's really uh, harder to, uh, number one, escaping North Korea has become harder. S uh, find a way to, um, freedom and safety in China became even more uh, challenging. Um, I, I didn't, we didn't talk about this um, most recently, but maybe I can ask you to talk a bit, because you've alluded to your sister's story. Um, and um, one of your, um, I, I, I've had two North Korean students in my entire life, and one of them I had at Columbia a couple of years ago. And I know you know her as well. Yan Ming. Yes. Yan Ming. And she um, has written a book about her own story and her and her mother being sold to men in China. And the, the extraordinarily um, complex, nuanced story of, of women being able to escape and the perversities of the story of where, because there are, because of the one child policy in China, there's a demand for women that isn't met in China and so there is a, a there are these this trade in women from North Korea, from Burma, um, from a few other places. It has a, a, a hideous vulgarity to it of the sale of a body, but in terms of the story that she tells, for example, it was a tool that she was able to use in order to manipulate and start the path to actually escaping the country. And I I wonder about that if you if you can comment a little bit about that. I mean this is one path that has been a path of escape, but a path of escape into what can often be very repressive. And then on top of that, the Chinese government has often sent people back at times. There have been waves of that. Is that, can, is that a phenomenon that you can help us to understand, to talk about it all? Or is that one that the phenomenon of, of the trade in women mm -hmm. and how that is evolving? So it's, it's deeply, whenever I think about those stories, it really uh, makes me really um, upset, to say the least. But it is also true that women in North, North Korean women in China, uh, they are like more vulnerable than uh, North Korean defectors in China in some ways because of the. Uh, I guess, um, how do I say this? Um, yeah, they're often uh, taken to sex trafficking industries. Uh, they're forced to sit in front of a, a camera and perform uh, with no pay. And uh, that is, for me, it's more it could be uh, my sister also. Uh, it could be, um, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, uh, how do and, I? And has China responded to any pressure about this? Or when they get the pressure, do they simply deport these women back to North Korea? They're definitely uh, uh, sending, sending them back to North Korea whenever they uh, find them, but it's also, you have to understand why North Koreans in China were facing so much difficulties is because um, by law, if a Chinese citizen uh, shares at least uh, one glass of water with a North Korean, uh, they are subject to be punished either 
if they have to pay a, a monetary fine or if they can, if they, if they don't have enough money to pay that fine, then they have to serve uh, in, a, in a jail for, a, I don't know how, how many days. Vice versa, if a Chinese citizen report a suspected North Korean, they also get reward. So that's where the bad guys, in, for example, like sex trafficking industries or the brokers, they take advantage of a North Korean woman. Because for example, when my mom went to China with my sister, she had given two options. One, you either sell your daughter to a man or if you don't agree with the, my offer, then I will report you to local police. Then my sister and my mom would both be sent back to North Korea. So it's that systematic um, oppression gives an opportunity for this uh, uh, certain group of people to exploit the situation and uh, which is unacceptable. Uh, and yet it has been happening and yeah. Um, I'd like to do a couple of things before we go to questions and I, I hope you will have questions. Um, maybe um, we could pause for a moment and, and if you could reflect back on your time coming to Bard. You know, we, we are at a moment when the value of liberal arts education is under attack. We're at a moment when the whole question of what is intellectual inquiry and um, what, it, what it should look like. And I wonder if you can, if you would, if you would mind, I mean, sharing with students as they're getting started what it, what it meant for you. You, you, you. you came out of North Korea, you fled to China, you land in the United States, you study business in a community college, which I'm sure it was good, but different in terms of the kind of study. And then you're thrust into this space of uh, a kind of a different form of inquiry. Um, what, what values did you, have you taken from that? I mean, I, I listened to you and I know you, you can't speak without quoting from some of the things that you read and thought about, but I wonder if you can share what, that, what, what worked for you in that, how, that, how it served you. Number one, I think, Bar I mean, Bard College has been, it's a special place for me, not only for its excellent, uh, uh, not only is it uh, an excellent place for learning, but also it, uh, this school has been very generous with my scholarship. I had uh, uh, full tuition to attend, so I'm very grateful, and I remain uh, grateful to this school for giving me the opportunity to pursue uh, an education. And uh, in terms of uh, your question, um, give me one second. Sure. Um, I, growing up with uh, an Asian upbringing, meaning where speaking out loud or speaking up in class was not welcomed and not recommended in my culture, versus coming to Bart, it was all about uh, I mean, the, a lot of times the classes were about uh, having an open debate and open discussion and dialogue. So it was very hard for me to uh, adapt that new uh, setting or culture within, with my second, uh, in, with, and then I had an uh, issue with uh, linguistic barriers. So I remember going to um, like coming out of each class, I like replay the questions that I asked in class and the way I asked. And I remember just uh, the mistakes that I made and I really like uh, felt depressed not being able to articulate and ask better questions. But the only way that I could improve was keep asking and keep speaking up because because I was, if I was embarrassed and feared of making mistakes and not asking questions, then I would not have progressed at all. So I think that 
experience alone was um, really valuable for me. Um, I think it teaches you about uh, uh, humility and confidence in the same time because um, confidence in the sense that um, I know, let me take it back, humility in the sense that I walked each class with knowing that I uh, know so little and it's an opportunity to meet the new world. Confidence in the sense that uh, it's a place where um, asking questions was so encouraged and professors and faculty members at Bard, I think doing I think they do a great job encouraging their students to speak up, even if they uh, have a hard time articulating their questions. So I think that experience was uh, so valuable for me. Was anything else you would say about the things, about classes, places where you read things that really helped you to develop the, the ideas for what you're doing now? So, yes. Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I really liked uh, political philosophy and theory classes. I remember going to, in my first year, I was taking an uh, introduction to political philosophy course with uh, Professor Samantha Hill. I think she left uh, Bart. But, so we read about uh, Aristotle, Plato, all the way to contemporary philosophers. And uh, I remember one of the homework was to read um, Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. That was in, uh, English was already my second language. And then this was in old English. I remember reading introduction, two pages. I think was it first? Of Man, I think is the title of that chapter. It's like only two pages. I read probably like three times and it may took like over three hours and I still didn't understood, uh, understand. So I went to uh, uh, office hours and asked for help. And that uh, first essay uh, writing assignment was to, I remember that question very specifically. It was. Uh, write about what's the difference between wisdom and knowledge in, in Plato's and, and Antigone? I, I forgot. So it was about writing an uh, essay on the difference between wisdom and knowledge. And I, it was my first year. I wanted to do well, and I wanted to impress my professor. So I worked really hard, and I finished my paper in like a few days in advance, and I uh, send it to my professor saying, in, you know, I would like to get a, a feedback before I get a final grade. And I thought she would say, this is great, uh, just work on a, a few more of this. And then she asked me to come into office hours, and she was basically saying, I'm sorry, Joseph, but this is not acceptable academic paper. I will give you another week to work on it. Uh, and which I ended up getting an A on that uh, from that class, but it was so hard, but those classes really helped me to expand my thinking. So I always enjoyed uh, uh, classes such as political theory, and um, human rights was, uh, was more personal than uh, academic, uh, but still uh, I greatly enjoyed, I still remember some of the uh, concepts that we studied in class. And um, international politics was uh, obviously was my major, so I really enjoyed them. But answer to your question, funny enough, I did well on all those uh, hard cl uh, di classes like political philosophy and international relations. And I had to take uh, art history or as a requirement, and I, I really don't care about much about art or I don't understand art that much. So I didn't do well and I was not interested in that class. And it, this was a class about making maps. And I was like, we have Google map today. Why do I have to know about ancient maps? So I like 
I think I ended up getting B from that class. My point is that the classes, classes that I studied really hard uh, helped me asking better questions, but not really giving me, uh, helped me to arrive and answer. I think that's what uh, the philosophy courses are meant to be. On the other hand, this course uh, that art his, uh, history course that I did not enjoy at the time ended up making the, I think I appreciate that class the most because in that class we basically studied about um, as a map maker in ancient time, what do you put in the um, space of map? Because they have the, um, okay, I'm not gonna go into that detail, but basically through that class, I realized what I do every day becomes who I am. Meaning after that class, I went through my uh, YouTube account and Google uh, a search engine uh, history and I basically studied um, what I watched and what I researched. And I realized that uh, some of them were irrelevant to the goal that I would like to accomplish. And that uh, made me help to, I'm really struggling with this, so uh, let me, let me find the next. It's a great story though, I love it. Um, basically, after that class, I asked myself, how do I want to spend my time uh, every day? Because what I watch, uh, what I do, what I repeatedly do become who I am. And I didn't want to watch um, uh, random stuff. Like um, I remember when I looked at uh, my YouTube uh, account, I was watching poker tournaments for hours I and hours. Uh, Texas Hold'em poker tournament. Oh, Texas Hold'em. Texas yes. Hold'em uh, yes. poker tournaments, yeah. And I was uh -huh. like, I wanted to become, I wanted to work on human rights issues and how does this help me? And I was Maybe it helps, actually. spending like hours. So after that class, I made intentional about what I watch and how I spend my time. So. Yes, I think the classes that I found it most difficult, and then I had this class that I really didn't care much, but ended up giving me uh, a really good lesson to be better with uh, how I spend my time. That seems like the greatest uh, advice for everybody, although I feel like I should probably watch Texas Hold'em and learn a lot. I'd get a lot out of that for my career. We can trade. We can trade, yeah, excellent. <laughs> Um, so, so when Joseph was leaving and he told me that he had a job at the uh, Bush um, Foundation, and I was nervous, of course, because, you know, we Bard professors, we, we share our beliefs and our politics. We recognize that people have other politics, but, uh, you know, my whole career is about raising doubts and being skeptical, and George Bush's role in the world is not one that I admired. Um, and, and, and so we talked about it at the time, and I'm really excited that, that I mean, Joseph went in there eyes open knowing what he was doing, and I think he's come to respect you know, the parts of George Bush that have been committed to humanitarianism and human rights and are there. And do you wanna say a few words about what your work has become and what the foundation, the center does and sort of the bright spots of, of your work? Sure. Um, one, I come to uh, uh, know President Bush uh, more and he, uh, Based on my experience, uh, he is a uh, man of uh, principles and uh, he is man of, uh, um, he's very kind and genuine. And I know, um, and that's my, uh, to be honest, he's actually, uh, when I grow up, I would like to become as kind as humble, as um, confident person he is. And in terms of my work, I, uh, I work at the Human Freedom Initiative at the George W. Bush Institute, where we focus on uh, a few different things. Number one is on North Korea. We work on uh, to promote policy that would integrate 
uh, human rights and security at the same time. And uh, another part of our work is providing scholarship to, uh, to North Korean refugees. And I was one of the first re uh, recipient of that uh, scholarship and I remain uh, grateful to President Bush and uh, George W. Bush Institute for uh, founding a scholarship program for the North Korean refugees in the United States. There are no other uh, scholarship foundations for the North Korean refugees, so it's very rare opportunity that, uh, which in my opinion changes uh, uh, lives of uh, many North Koreans living in the United States. So that's one uh, part of the uh, work. And we also focus on uh, freedom and democracy, both at home and abroad. So we look at the health of uh, uh, our democracy at home and also an opportunity to uh, promote uh, uh, our values in abroad. And another part of a program that Human Freedom focuses on is uh, uh, helping to develop young leaders in Burma uh, to become the next uh, generation of the leaders to change the society they live in. Obviously, with their uh, recent coup, we, um, um, we have to uh, redesign and uh, think about different ways to uh, continue helping the uh, scholars from Burma. So those are uh, specific focus from my team, but Bush Institute as a whole, uh, President Bush recently published uh, a book uh, called uh, Out of Many One. It's a portrait of 43 Americans, 43 re uh, Im uh, immigrants and refugees, and this uh, the purpose of this book uh, is to, to demonstrate and illustrate that immigration is, um, is a blessing to our uh, country for both economically and politically. They create jobs when they come to the United States. Uh, they uh, bring diversity, different uh, backgrounds, which uh, flourishes our uh, uh, democracy in my understanding. So those are some of things that we, uh, um, as an institute, uh, focuses. We believe in, uh, we believe that freedom is uh, universal and that, that everyone should be uh, entitled and enjoy the freedom that we uh, enjoy today. And yes. Wonderful, thank you. I think it's really important to uh important to hear, especially when it's so easy sometimes from a distance to judge, um, to judge people and, and, to, and to make assumptions about what, um, what would otherwise be going on there. Um, shall we have questions? Yes, in the back. Okay, good. On the live stream. Okay, yeah. yeah. Who raised their hand for If I knew I was going to have to have a mic, um, I might not have had a mic. Um, so I have a, I have a really like generic hope that there could be peace uh, and um, human rights that the North Koreans could enjoy. What I keep stumbling over and have stumbled over for years is like, what is a practical hope I could have, even a small one? Um, my head explodes when I, when I consider the fact geopolitically that North Korea is a nuclear power um, that enjoys threatening, right, uh, to use them in a way. So I also think about, I don't know how well we understand what is going on in the country. Um, you know, we've been for, in Afghanistan for 20 years and, you know, seem to have left that in a mess, right? Like, so how, what do we know would destabilize a country in a productive way or allow for change in a productive way or allow, you know, set something off that would um, destabilize it in a way that could be kind of more dangerous. Um, so I'm just, I'm asking for like anything because I haven't detected from any president that I'm aware of 
of any coherent foreign policy to figure out a solution. My only understanding is just as a citizen is that we, we are hoping China figures something out in some ways because maybe they have more influence than we do. So I find, like I said, I have a pie in the sky hope for peace on earth, you know, to mean that I can pray to, but I don't know what a first step would be or a second step would be or a, like any, any practical vision, right? Like of, of what could happen. So I am aware of uh, the recent development in uh, Afghanistan and uh, Bush Institute is also working very hard, especially these days, to uh, look for different options to help our allies and partners safely getting out of that country. Having said that, uh, it is not my uh, area of expertise, so I can't really speak on uh, about the challenges, but when I read and listen to news um, and podcasts, I think a lot of times we focus on um, whether we agree or disagree with uh, one uh, political view over another, I think we have plenty of time for that in the future. Uh, I mean, colleges and universities are a great place to have that debate going forward. But today, I think it's a, it's a, we have to focus on solutions. Uh, and I hope that, that this uh, uh, country and uh, uh, politics uh, people in D.C. will spend more time on um, come up with the solutions. In terms of uh, going back to actionable items, uh, I think when it, in North Korea particularly, particularly yes, you're right, uh, when it, it's, it, you don't know, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, one way is to learn more about uh, the human rights issues and the views going on. Because uh, a lot of, I, in my opinion, all the great uh, changes come from the minds. Uh, you have to have the uh, information and uh, knowledge and the uh, uh, heart to change and help. So that's one uh, place. But also there are all uh, organizations that uh, focus on bringing, rescuing North Korean refugees from uh, China to safe safety like South Korea or the United States. So, for example, I didn't actually uh, mention about an organization that brought me to United States. It's uh, called uh, LINK, stands for Liberty in North Korea. It's a fascinating organization. It was actually founded by college students on college campus. campus. Basically, uh, a group of uh, students uh, watched documentary about North Korean human rights issues, and they said it's not uh, it's enough. Uh, let's do something about it, and they uh, started this uh, uh, fundraising. And basically, they from selling uh, fried Oreos to um, different uh, through different uh, concerts or parties, they uh, raised enough money to brought me to the United States. So. If anyone from the audience uh, have a doubt that you are too young or that you are too, uh, that you are not well educated enough to, uh, to bring changes in the world, um, I, would, I would kindly disagree. Uh, you, have the, uh, you have the power and opportunity to make what's uh, possible into reality. And uh, without that, group of college students, I would not be here today. So um, I know this is uh, a times of um, it's difficult times, but I think through these difficult times, uh, we also wanted to uh, imagine, uh, we want to prepare for worse, but we also always wanted to um, wish for the best. And I think we have that uh, opportunity and power to do some, do tangible goods that actually changes lives. More questions?
Um, hi, so um, the question that I have is generally to talk more about the moral responsibility and the legal responsibility that other countries might have when it comes to um, human rights and protecting human rights. Um, so I'm from a country where our own government um, isn't necessarily the best at protecting human rights of individuals unless they're like extremely privileged people. Um, and we have lots of issues going on in our own country um, in terms of people fighting for their rights, in terms of people fighting for separation or just liberty as well. Um, with that said, we have large actors across the world who are considered to be the superpowers, the US, Russia, China, who generally don't have the best track record when it comes to protecting human rights. We've seen that in places like Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, um, and within China we've seen it with North Koreans, we've seen it with Uyghur Muslims, uh, we see it in Rohingya and Burma, all these places. Uh, with that said, what then do you think would be the best practical method for relying on different countries or relying on different actors to try to benefit human rights? And if that can't happen, what would be the best method to try to bring about a change in terms of protecting human rights or guaranteeing human rights uh, for individuals? Is that clear enough, or should we press him to be more specific? I would like to have some more say. I, I think it's a good, I mean, you laid out the question beautifully, but I wonder if you could focus more on what you mean in terms of the responsibility of other countries or, or relying on other countries, yeah. and maybe even give your own, your own idea of what you think is possible. You're talking about how you pressure other countries, what's appropriate, Right, so it's more, um, more about like the accountability that we can place on other countries. How so, much can they be accountable? Yeah, how much can how we... Much should, how much is the United States accountable for, what's, for taking action for North Korea? How much is... Right, yeah, so uh, how much can we hold other countries accountable for taking uh, action in other countries where human rights aren't guaranteed? North Korea is one of them. Um, even places like Afghanistan right now is one of them. Uh, how, how can we just hold other countries responsible um, for trying to maintain human rights within those countries since we can't rely on like the governments of those countries to do it, um, since they're the ones suppressing the rights in a lot of cases. How do we hold them accountable? How do we pressure them to act? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. I, but I think that um, question should, you should answer that question. <laughs> I think. Um, let me respond in this way. Um, again, I think I'm, I'm well aware of uh, some of the domestic issues at home, uh, and I'm not saying that there is no issues in the United States. But at the same time, I... Let me, give me one second. Um, let me put it in this way. Just because we are imperfect, doesn't mean we cannot desire for perfect perfection. Meaning, I mean, think about probably no mother is a perfect human being. Uh, if that mother is perfect, then perhaps she's not a human anymore. But just because she's not perfect doesn't mean we should demand her to her not to kill her children, right? So. That's my, uh, that's how I view. So yes, uh, United States, we have issues at home that, has, that must be addressed. But at the same time, it's also, uh, we have the, we should care about countries in abroad. And um, in terms of uh, holding accountable of uh, these oppression, uh, oppressors, uh, and regimes in other country. Yeah, it is difficult, but just because it's difficult, when we give up, these oppressors become even more oppressive. So for example, uh, I think the current uh, heated debate uh, in international politics or relations is uh, what does uh, the world would look like when China uh, increase to when they gain more power in international stage. I think that, in my understanding, uh, the United States is a powerful nation, not only because we have the best economy and the best uh, milit 
military equipment, but it's also the ideas and uh, that we uh, promoted that, that, that also we, um, it's the basic understanding that uh, the human rights of other countries is equally important as ours at home. I think that that idea is also makes us uh, unique. The question is, would China, when they gain so much power, would they focus on uh, improving human rights of other countries when they uh, have um, concentration camps for Uyghurs? I mean, the, it's not sure. And uh, I think, yes, give me one second to... Uh, I think when the United States um, uh, withdraw their roles in uh, uh, being the human rights champion or promoting human rights in abroad, I think when we, I think that's an opportunity for countries like Russia and China to uh, gain more power, and I'm not sure if that's necessarily would be a be better and safer world, and I worry that absence of a U.S. role in the international uh, community is an opportunity for right, uh, those competing uh, power countries. And so, yeah, again, uh, I recognize that we are not perfect, but at the same time, we should still strive for better and uh, perfection. So to say something, but I'll say it at the end. We're going to their question. Um, I don't want to speak for the person who uh, just asked the question before, but um, I feel like I think this was like a part of their first a question that they initially asked, and I would like I guess an answer to this part of the question. Um, how do you want? It doesn't even just have to be the United States. If, I guess because due to a lot of the bigger powers, bad track record with, I guess, participating in other um, people's foreign, foreign affairs and everything, how would you like, I guess, people to feel, um, well, citizens in that country, how would you like for them to feel, I guess, comfortable with some foreign, like, interaction due to, I guess, history of sometimes foreign action going like wrong. Like a lot of the issues that, um, I'm not saying with North Korea, but with other issues, I feel like um, a lot of it was caused by foreign interaction, some of which is like because of the United States, some of which is because of China, some of which is because of Russia. How would you, I guess, like how would we go about, I guess, fixing that due to their bad track record. Not to say that like anyone has to be perfect or anything, it's just um, if like someone has a historic pattern of doing something, then obviously people are gonna be, I guess, um, like wary, I guess. Sorry if my question's confusing. I think the questions are really good and I see they, can I, can I, can I just ask you all a question? How many of you think that no matter what the United States does, once it intervenes, it's going to make things worse? So I think that that's a, a powerful position, and it's a hard one to overcome because of the way we sometimes approach history. And what I heard Joseph say is something that's more familiar to me from what I hear from activists around the world, which is the United States has been really awful. It's worse if they're gone. You know, the food is terrible, and there's not enough of it. It's a strange and, and, and contradictory position. When I went to the UN at the point that uh, Trump was in office, and I was sitting with a Sudanese friend who'd been a big critic of the United States for out, throughout the years, he said the worst thing we're facing here at the UN is that the United States has shut up on human rights issues. 
I didn't like them when they were in control. I hate their arrogance. It's worse when they don't say anything. And I think that's the, that's the dynamic. And I think it's, a, it's something you should put on your agendas for your college careers to consider and to explore because there ain't no easy answer to it. It's a, it's a ripping dilemma for how to engage in the world to try to make things better and if there's a way to do it. And the only thing I would add to that as, a, as someone who's been in this world for the last 30 some years is that there's no, no single solution. There's no such thing as do no harm. That's the stupidest motto outside of, the, the, outside of being a doctor in a clinic it's useless. There's no such thing. You'll never know what harm you might cause by being there or not being there. And you have to be able to balance and think about those risks. So that's my, but that's, that's what I wanted to bring out in your question because I feel like that's part of it. We're, we're many of us in the room are sitting thinking, look, tell me, you know, of course I look at this and it looks like we could intervene and help, but I know if the U.S. does it, they're just going to screw things up. If you can get Sweden and the Gambia and Costa Rica to lead troops, great. Yeah, sorry, go back to you. No, you're fine. Um, I, I somewhat agree. Um, it's just that, and I saw like, when I guess, when I looked around and I saw like some people, I guess, raise their hand and like say that, um, that like they think that any sort of United States interaction would like cause harm. I could understand like their sentiment, I guess due to how, and this isn't just the United States, this is with like a lot of the big powers, how um, I guess their help per se and their activism is um, based off of a profit motive, I guess. And I feel like once they like take the resources and take I guess what they need from a country that is struggling or a place that is struggling, I feel like um, they're not gonna really continue being as much help. And I feel like we've seen that in history multiple times. So um, I don't, like, I can understand why people, um, I guess, like, like I said, are wary. Yeah, well, let's, let's go back to Joseph. And just to, 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 let me just add to that and hopefully not take away to say, I imagine that you deal with a lot of people who are pretty belligerent, who think U.S. should just go in and bomb them and solve this problem. I, and, and, and so you probably have to see, you probably see people across a spectrum in terms of people who say, we need to intervene well, versus it's a, we can't intervene in this way. Can you, can you comment on that yourself in terms of what you see out there as far as that will to intervene? and the willingness to acknowledge the risks? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think the technical term for that is uh, there's two different approaches in terms of North Korea. One is a soft landing and one is hard landing. And I'm not an expert on this subject, so I sh really shouldn't talk about it. But based on my limited understanding of the two uh, terminologies that hard landing is where Yes, we take troops and we bomb the city and the strategic locations. But I'm afraid that that is not possible because North Korean regime has nuclear weapons. I don't know how, to st how one state can start a war and not be hurt. I mean... It's not a matter of whether you, you, whether United States will win the war or not, but if just one, um, yeah, I don't know nuclear weapons. I'm just worried that uh, that it it could uh, the conventional war tactics could easily escalate into nuclear uh, war and. We certainly don't want to. We certainly understand the outcome of uh, what nuclear war could would look like. So that's, in my opinion, should be avoided. Soft landing is where we. Uh, it's slow change, uh, but that start with uh, perhaps working with uh, in economic providing economic in incentive for the North Korean regimes to slowly open up uh, the borders. 
worldwide stand. I'm not sure if. Give me one second. Um, I have to think a little bit more about it, but it's. Um, I'm not sure if we have uh, uh, a good, good uh, actionable items that would deliver um, the goals that we would like to see. Sorry, that was really poorly um, addressed answer to your beautiful question. Or I, I think we need to end, right? Yeah, I, I was going to say these. Uh, I just want to encourage. We'll do maybe one more question. I do, one of the things I wanted to say is that. In the conversation, we've been talking about governments and sort of foreign policy action. And um, I would say one of the benefits of the United States is that we have civil society. And that's something that we have. You spoke a little bit about how important civil society. It wasn't a government that was important to getting you to the United States. It was, it was the actions of individuals and citizens. And um, I co-teach um, in the Open Society University Network. And we had a class this summer. And we had about uh, seven students from Afghanistan. And what we are hearing from them now is Americans don't know how powerful their individual voices are, and they're not using their individual voices on behalf of us. So there are governments, and then there are people. And um, there's a great book by Eric Liu um, who, called You're More Powerful Than You Think. And every time I he I'm, I'm reading Stacey Abrams' book right now on elections, and every time that there's an organizer, they talk about power. And they talk about how governments convince us sometimes that we don't have power or that we can't do things. And the actions of those college students, um, the example that you gave, Joseph, is very powerful. It's, and, and what we see when we see the big picture is that we see that it's very hard to be an actor in that situation and that it's very complicated and maybe I don't have the expertise. But there are ways that you can take action, both for the things that you care about domestically at home, which actually reflect transnationally. So what you're doing at home around elections or around your community can have a transnational impact. And what we haven't really talked about is transnational organizations and other organizations that also have their complicated histories with NGOs and everything and, and acting and being, um, being problematic. But there are ways, that's why you're here, is to study and imagine what is possible. Because without imagination, without aspiration, I think that's what you were getting at, Joseph, without that, then without some radical hope um, that, that then you can kind of give in to the um, the nihilism, and I think what what our what our friends are saying within the Bard Network, at least, is please don't give in to that, um, because that is also an easy way to not be, uh, uh, you know, acting in some way. And I think that nihilism and cynicism is an, is important, um, and being out in the field is important too. So how do you balance all of those things? And that's what we're you're going to wrestle with these huge questions the whole time that you're here. But when part of why BARD is part of this big international network is that we believe colleges have the responsibility to be civic actors. And that's why we're in partnership with these 40 universities around the world. That's why we are a partner with the American University of Afghanistan, which is now closed and where the Taliban is now in charge. That was a university two weeks ago. So imagine the response of those students and imagine what that's like. And so then you can't just give up on them and say, oh, well, the United States, you know, whatever. But it's so important to ask these big questions. So you ask the really big questions, while at the same time you ask yourself, OK, so what do I, what, what responsibility do I have? And it may be just doing a fundraising, raising awareness. You know, a lot of social media, you guys are really socially, social media savvy. So I think it's like demanding answers to the big questions and demanding a lot out of your government while also asking the same things of yourselves, too. And that's part of what we ask in our classes. What is our responsibility to this? Um, and I think that's what Peter's been getting out of it, too. So it's really complicated and messy. Um, but, without, uh, but we have the ability to actually ask these questions and talk honestly to each other. That, and that isn't necessarily the case in some other places. So I'm going to end on your question. Is that OK? And then obviously, Joseph's around, and he's part of the BARD network, and so is available to you. And he's, you know, he can be connected with you in the future if you want. Um, yeah, I, I want to be respectful of your time and everybody, everyone's time here. I just have a really small question uh, to do with US foreign policy. 
Um, so obviously we've seen over the years U.S. foreign policy has substantially changed um, from Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. Um, so my country in particular was um, ravaged by the war on terror to a degree, not as much as Afghanistan, but um, pretty close to Afghanistan. Uh, my question for you specifically, uh, Joseph, is uh, how have you seen U.S.'s foreign policy on North Korea change over time? Um, obviously, we, we saw it change substantially from Obama to Trump um, and now probably to Biden as well. Um, how have you seen those changes occur and uh, have you seen those changes to be positive, negative, inter uh, given the different presidents and what do you think the best approach to U.S.'s foreign policy on North Korea going forward would be? Yes, so much simplicity. Um, so, f start with uh, uh, President Bush's uh, time, and he had a strong uh, stance on North Korean regime and how the regime w is treating its own citizens. And um, he but he also uh, opened the pathway for North Korean refugees to be able to come to U.S. If it wasn't that 2004 uh, North Korean Human Rights uh, Act, which uh, President Bush signed and became U.S. law, I could not come to the United States. So yes, you can disagree, uh, disagree about his uh, policy on North, on North Korea, but I don't think anyone can dispute the, the, um, the opportunities that he uh, laid out for North Korean, for many North Korean refugees to come to the United States, and that includes myself. In terms of uh, during uh, President Obama's uh, administration, I think the, the exact term t was uh, str strategic patience. I still don't understand well enough about to make a comment, but um, in terms of uh, political actions, I don't think there was any, um, I don't think North Korea was big uh, priority during that administration. But at the same time, uh, Ambassador Samantha Power, who was U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, had, and she worked on, she had, she definitely comes from a human rights activist background and as a journalist, so I think it was uh, great to have her uh, and have her support in raising, continuously raising awareness uh, in, uh, at home, but also in, on international stage. President Trump's administration was, in my opinion, I mean, I was disappointed because when he became president and when he visited uh, South Korea in 2017, I believe, uh, he spoke great deal about uh, uh, North Korean human rights issues at his speech during uh, where he gave in the parliamentary, South Korean parliamentary. And then we saw uh, a complete different um, a change uh, in 2000, after two, and even in 2018, uh, he invited to uh, a few North Korean refugees and highlighted their story at the State of the Union address. And then when he actually had the opportunity to meet with uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un, uh, he basically chose not to mention anything about human rights. So the question is, was, North, was human right, North Korean human rights rhetoric, was it a political tool or a goal for, for, for him? In my end, if I have to guess, and based on, yeah, I think it was more of a, a political goal, uh, political tool than a goal. So as a North Korean refugee, I was very disappointed to see his interactions with uh, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un. I keep 
referring his title because I wanted to be make sure um, that I am respectful of the the uh, conference, but not respecting the individual. Or, but uh, having said that, yeah, I mean, I think um, it was not a bright moment of U.S. Uh, history. I mean. United President of the United States doesn't go to, uh, doesn't just say, oh, I'm good friend of a uh, human rights uh, oppressor. That does not sit well as, uh, it just does not look good on, um, that's not what uh, American presidents uh, stands for. Uh, they don't, they're not supposed to go and say, I'm a uh, good friend of uh, this person who he knows, knew uh, that he was the, he was not treating his own people well. So it was disappointing moment. I don't know where, what the um, United States policy on North Korea today, uh, well enough to make a comment, but I hope that uh, this uh, administration would recognize that that human rights has to be central of its uh, foreign policy uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with North Korea because United States cannot achieve its goal of denuclearizing the regime without seeing the improvement of uh, human rights at home. So. I don't, in my opinion, human rights and security challenges are not separate uh, subject. I think they're uh, connected and that must be addressed. And I hope that uh, we would make um, a right choice. I think lastly, I, yeah, actually I would end there, but uh, really relevant to your question, I guess my last um, words for you is to, um, enjoy your uh, first year, uh, study hard, but also um, have fun and discover yourself and uh, learn from each other. And I hope that you really have a uh, great time and uh, you are in a great place to um, challenge your uh, thoughts. And if anything, this is a place where you are allowed to express any questions that you have. So. Congratulations and uh, have a great uh, and successful year. So I think that's a perfect place to end and I, um, I, I wanna thank Joseph and thank you. I feel like we really covered a kind of a, we flew, we flew high and we, uh, and we descended to, to really important points. I'll just, I just want to, I just want to end with kind of connecting the pieces for me and for you in a way that I think hopefully will add to what, what Joseph has said. Joseph has told us an international story that takes place in ways that are beyond our reach and yet come home to us in different ways because of, of choices by the people have made, the, the issues they've taken on in their, in their colleges and elsewhere, and the, the search for ways to be helpful, to be useful, to connect while also being politically savvy and aware. Um, and I think that's, those are the issues of our times and they're changing and none of us have answers. We, we live near where the birthplace of Eleanor Roosevelt um, was and there's a nice statue to Eleanor Roosevelt there with a nice little plaque. Um, and, and Eleanor Roosevelt's an intriguing character and, and I hope you'll kind of think about her in somewhere in the course of your education because she played such an intriguing role in, in national, local, and international politics. And, and among other things, was headed the commission that drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and was really pushed out by, by the Republicans afterwards during the Cold War. She was a powerful figure. Even before Franklin, she was a powerful figure. And, 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 and in answering the question, you know, where do human rights start, she, she, she said, she had one of her lines was, um, that they, they, that human rights start, oh, now we got the, as I said that, of course, the exact At words. home. Well, not at home, but in small places in close small to places. home. Small places that don't have, that are out of In small places close to home. 
And I think that sense of, you know, there were various times in the story of human rights where we became so focused on the global, on the international, that we also lost track of the local and lost track of issues in our own lives and our families and our communities. And I think the issues in our lives and families are back on the agenda in really powerful ways, but to recognize the interconnections and to be able to act on them and find ways to do it, you know, I, I, there's, I, hope, I hope you will all give that some thought in the course of your years here at Bard. So thank you and thank Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph.